I'm back in California's Sacramento Valley, not for rice fat and ducks out of my friend's farm field, but to see the Sacramento River itself. The Sacramento is not what I would call a natural ecosystem. Over 95% of its original wetlands are now occupied by farmland. The river is channelized, dammed, and diverted in order to provide flood control for housing, drinking water to cities, irrigation to the farms, and ideally enough water for four runs of Chinook salmon, sturgeon, steelhead, and everything else that calls this river home. Chinook, or king salmon, were so abundant in the Sacramento River that early Europeans said you could walk across the river on their backs without getting your feet wet. Currently, however, salmon returns are, well, you'd need some really tall boots. Winter run Chinook are considered endangered and spring run are threatened. This time around, I'm looking for Chinook and Striper and talking with the people who target them. First, I'm meeting up with Dave Jacobs, a guy who knows more about salmon fishing than I do mustaches. Having been a guide in this fishery for almost 30 years, Dave's giving me his perspective on the river and California kings. You're out here fishing salmon every single day. Six months out of the year, yeah, straight. And you're doing it for a living, right? That's your that's your profession. I've raised three daughters on fishing income. That's awesome. Okay, well, what we're gonna do today, I'll just kind of teach you just like I would teach the people that come on board every day. A lot of people know salmon come up the river to where they were born and they, they spawn and they die after they spawn, but a lot of people don't know why they die. Well, the reason the salmon die is when they enter the fresh water from the salt water, they lose their stomach. They don't eat anymore. When they leave the salt water, they're gonna engorge themselves and fatten up because their journey up river could be a couple of months or greater before they lay their eggs. Okay, and the best way for me to describe what we're doing is we're not feeding the salmon. We're trying to aggravate them with this. We're trying to make them mad. And as he swims up the river, every small fish he encounters darts out of the way, darts out of the way. Then all of a sudden he comes to right here where we're at on the river and Cal and Dave are going down with our quick fish. And here comes two more little fish just to irritate King Kong. And that's what we're trying to do today is aggravate them, get them to grab this lure, and that's how we get them to bite. And you're just working these things back, kind of like force feeding this fish. Force feeding, but not feeding, right. Right, how far up are we uh, from the salt right now in river miles, do you think? I would say we're over 180 miles. Okay, yeah, wow. That's a big problem. That's one of the big problems we have with our king salmon is our hatchery is way up here 200 miles away from the salt water. Mm -hmm. So baby salmon, as they're, they're reared in these hatcheries and then released, they go downstream. Well, they smell their way downstream. They smell every creek on the way down as a baby. And that's how they find their way home. But we've had very hostile river conditions with drought and other water users. You know, Southern California uses a lot of water, farming, irrigation, a lot, of, a lot of people depend on this water. And the fish are getting the short end of the stick. And that's why we're having such a problem. We need more water, we need better water. This is a theme of salmon conservation. How much water and when. Remember, the Sacramento and its major tributaries are dam controlled. Get everything nice and straight and true and get everything just the way I want it. Away I go, over the top, and they say, gosh, I bet you hook yourself a lot. And you're like, I do. Yeah, I, I do. do. Just drop that down. Uh, yep, hooks are untangled, reel the beat right there. Now, put the lure in the river, and then give it a pull. Pull it. Mm, nice swim. Swim of the lure here. You see how the action, it's kind of darts off to each side. Yeah. Hands-free fishing takes some getting used to, but letting the quick fish do the work pays off. Take them, take them, fish on. Don't thumb them, let them pull. Go down, swoop. Bring them to me, lift up. Good. Game over. Ooh, I had it. $20. <laughs> Whoa. Got some meat. Dude, this is my first ever shit up. 
first ever Chinook. Anglers are allowed two Chinook salmon per day with four in possession. Meaning, after you put two fish in the box, you are a catch and release angler until the following day. Lift. Since you've been through a couple of down periods now, yes. mm -hmm. like what are the what are the consistencies between those two down periods? Uh, lack of water. And when there's more water in the system, you're getting more fish back in the yeah. system. Better winters and better spring releases. Remember, we need our salmon smolt to be released into a favorable river environment, not a hostile river environment. The outmigration of the salmon smolt produced at Coleman Hatchery are going downriver precisely during the months of the upriver striper spawn. We have to somehow manage these flows to where we can get the flows up in the springtime to get these fish down safely and get them past the predation. Uh, there's a lot of other broken links here, but the number one puzzle piece that will fix all this is managing our water better and providing more water to these fish. If you have these flows, like you just talked about, that, that are either extremely low or poorly timed, you can put a lot more fish into that system and you're just gonna pump them out into a spot where fish can't exist, right? No. The problem is, is the number of fish and, and the size of our striper runs, the stripers are, are, the predation is incredible when you drop them into a hostile river environment like we do with low water. Now, if you have more fish, I think the salmon are going to get more of an upper hand on predation. The pred predators are going to get a lot of salmon, but not all of them, and they're going to survive and get to the salt water, and then they'll return. That's what we need is more numbers of fish to make it down past the predation. For our purposes today, I'm yes. very interested in checking out more of the predation, sure. as in get my hands on a predator. Well, we're going to definitely take you out, and at the right time to do it, it's going to be closer to the nighttime. We're going to take you out, and we're going to show you firsthand what these uh, stripers look like and what voracious meat eaters they are. They love, they love to eat. I'll admit my confidence in catching Chinook was high, both because of Dave's experience and we were just in water that felt like salmon. Now we're heading downstream where the water warms up and slows down to find the salmon predator everyone talks about, striper. What's like a feature that makes striper congregate? They like that deep, deep water, you know, and they get pressured and they like to hang out in the deeps and then they come into the shallows over here in the evenings and start to feed. Right here, it's like very good, very good piece of river. I cut up some bait. Here's what we're gonna use. These are some real meat eaters, so we're gonna give them what they want. And I want you to cut some of these up for me. Throw the head and tails right there in this bucket. Okay, so we'll rig you up a double hook. The first rig up is free. It's on me. All right. Got a lot of deep, deep water here with some shallows very close by with a lot of trees and structure for them to ambush. Do you think uh, this is part of the appeal of the striper? Like, I mean, you know, it's a great, for them, you can... it's a great fishing technique for families, you know, kids. There's lots of, lots of different things you're gonna be able to do. You know, you can take kids out, you can take teenagers out, you can take friends. You can bank fish, you can fish out of a big boat, little boat. It doesn't have to be a big fancy boat to go striper fishing. Well, it's interesting to me that, you know, you are the salmon guy, right? I love my salmon fishing. And if you listen to a lot of folks, man, if you're a salmon guy, you gotta be anti-striper. 
like wipe them all out. Well, you do, but listen, you know, we have the, the, the Guides and Sportsmen's Association and we raise a lot of money at these banquets and there's a lot of striper enthusiasts that are part of our, our organization. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need more people to join these type of organizations because we're the ones that get a seat at the table when it's time to come up with, with some of the policies that, that protect the fish and the wildlife. If it's the public voting, you know, with their numbers, like this fish can be a lot more accessible than a adult salmon. Yeah. You know, one that you got to trick into, into eating because it's not there to eat. It's there to get past you and spawn. That's right. There's one thing you can count on is there's more stripers in this river year round. Oh, yeah. And here they come. <laughs> oh, we won't tell anybody about that one. Is this even a striper? Yes, it is. Okay, we're on the board. We're on the board. Oh, no problem. Yeah. Bass heavy. Oh, I, uh, there were three other stripers this size following this one up. Oh, that's a Fish of the day. There'll be some big ones. Fish of the day. Real. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nothing wrong with that. You might be able to grab him by the lip. There you are. There's the bass thumb. The tuxedo bass. So, I mean, do you think this is the uh, the villain of all salmon in this river? Well, the smaller ones, I think we need to do a better job on. I think they work together to do a pretty good job on the kings. Striper definitely have been villainized, though, more than any other fish. That's for sure. Because if you get rid of stripers, another predator will take over. Yeah, and, and it's not like the only invasive species in the system. And right? another another interesting point is, some biologists do believe that stripers are a, a nice signal for the health of the delta. If you if you see oh, something, like an indicator species, an indicator species. If you see something bad happening with with stripers, it might signal that something's out of whack with the with the ecosystem. You know, because they're so visible all the time. Whereas salmon are kind of in runs. Exactly, and they occupy lots of different parts of the river in the delta. Sure. You see, so they're everywhere. You're gonna find out what's underneath this water someday if you ever get the chance. Oh, I'm I'm going, man. I'm you're I'm, doing it. Yeah, I'm I'm hooking up with Paul in the morning. Really? Yes. It's clear to me that even if we were allowed more than two fish per person, we wouldn't make a dent in the striper population. That being said, we can only see so much from the surface. So I'm hooking up with my buddy Paul Young and Greg Fonts to get a fish eye view in the morning. Today we're going to hit up a couple of my normal spots. These fish migrate in like packs usually at this time of year. So um, we're just going to go one spot to the next to the next and hopefully we find them. They're going to be somewhere in here. This is like the prime time right now. So you get August through September. Like. So the stripers are migrating at the same time as, as some salmon are starting to migrate through? The salmon are coming through, the stripers are already here. I mean, these stripers are here 24-7, 365. What, what's like the, the top things for, for diving striper today? Um, it's going to be not necessarily being quiet, but being smooth and not being threatening. So you don't want to come down and like smash a bunch of tree limbs, land on the bottom, flail your arms up in the air, swivel your head all over the place. You want to be... You want to hit the bottom and then just drop anchor like as quiet as you can be look straight have the gun straight out in front of you and you're just looking basically down the shaft and holding your breath and that's it both paul and greg are competitive divers in fact they've been all over the world which says something about their passion for spear fishing they're just as eager to jump into pristine blue water as they are the lower sacramento which is low visibility and full of concrete and rebar
river diving has its challenges. You need a lot of weight to keep the current from bouncing you down the river. So much weight that you can't rest while swimming. It's also fairly murky, making it hard to positively identify fish unless you're up close. Legally, striper is the only thing on our menu, so no shooting at fish shapes. Now Greg Fonts is a classic Spiro. He talks a lot before fishing, then gears up, disappears, and only reappears when he needs to drop off a dead fish. Real contributor, aren't you, Greg? So first uh, striper here. Yeah, congratulations. Where does this fall in the spectrum of, of uh, striperness, I guess? That would be in the extra rinky-dinky small schooly size. But that's the eater size. That's what That's what most guys would on rod and reel, that's what they take home. 22 and a quarter, something like that. You can you can find that size fish in just about every hole in this stretch of river for hundreds of miles. But at the same time, this is like what you're passing up. Usually that's what I'm passing up. I have uh, five kids, a lot of mouths to feed, so that's like my 18 year old son would eat that in like two bites. Uh huh. Greg is on board with a great eating fish. I'm excited to see what else we find. When I left Montana, I wanted to catch Chinook salmon and spearfish for stripers. Kill one to save the other, but I don't really believe that's the situation here. I'm conflicted over my time on the Sacramento. I love the place for having so much adventure, despite being in such proximity to millions of people. At the same time, I can't help but wonder, what type of bacterial cultures will my wetsuit grow after having swum in the river all day? Welcome to the salmon game, kids. Pretty good. Is it good? Pretty good. California king, California striped bass. Interesting uh, players, right? They both go out to sea, they both run up the river. Both get large. People love fishing for them. They have a dedicated audience. Both fish. Yeah. What's interesting to me about these two fish is like the striped bass is something that you can do anything with, whereas the salmon has a particular salmon flavor and you can do a lot with it, but it's always going to be like salmon. 
for me anyway, that's like an interesting kind of metaphor because I feel like there's a much broader appeal and it seems like there's the just more select group going after the salmon. I mean, do you guys think in like the uh, back and forth between rod angler and spearing with the striped bass that uh, that's like a consistent form of management for that fish? Everything in this river eats a salmon smolt, just about. Yep. So they have a real hard, you know, especially when the water's clear and low like this, they have a real hard uh, path to get out to the ocean to get bigger. Fish. Yeah, take into account the predators that the striper take out, they would take out the salmon as well. And there's some huge pike minnow, other, other predators in the river system. And then when you really boil it all down, it comes to water issues. And it's not gonna matter if there's predators that feed on the salmon. If we can't maintain the water temperatures and the, the waters you know, that we need to have the salmon bolt survive and actually make it to the ocean. Oh yeah, man, I mean, it's, it's a complex issue. I mean, I think as far as, like my playing around in California, like California is the place with the most people to me, like especially as a Montana kid, like growing up in Montana. It's like California, California, California. And every time I come here, it's amazing like how much kind of like wild adventure can be had. And like, we didn't see a lot of people today. No. We covered a lot of ground. The water was cold, it was clear, we saw a bunch of fish. Um, I'm totally happy with today, you know? We didn't limit out, but we all got fish. It was great. But you know, having that opportunity to go be selective in your backyard is pretty, pretty darn amazing. And you know, your opportunity is focused around striper. Other people's opportunity is focused around salmon. In the world of conservation, it is rare to come across an issue that can be fixed with one thing. We often point to predators as one thing, be it a wolf or a striper. In my brief time on the Sacramento, it's clear that stripers are a valued and abundant part of this system. Where the river slows down and warms up, salmon smolt are going to have a hard time. But as it was pointed out, everything eats the salmon. They are biologically built for that. Looking at these downstream conditions only lead me back upstream and back to the question of how much water and when.